layer shifts are one of the most frustrating ways a 3D print can fail. Today, we look at the three types that can occur and how to avoid or fix each of them. I have a website on GitHub, completely free of charge, that is best known for the calibration prints that it provides. But it actually has some very useful pages related to troubleshooting, which we are adding to today with a guide to fixing and avoiding layer shifts. Let's start by defining what exactly a layer shift is. And we know that when we slice our model, it's built layer by layer from the bed up. When we have a layer shift partway through the print, Instead of the next layer being built directly on top of the previous one, we have an unexpected misalignment that moves the rest of the print offset from where it should be. Hence the name, it looks like the layers have shifted from where they're meant to be, and this Yoda bust is a good example. It's had one significant layer shift, and everything is offset from that point. Here's another example where the layer shift occurred quite early on, and being a functional bracket, this part is now useless. And sometimes you'll have a series of small layer shifts where the alignment is creeping every layer rather than just one big abrupt one. In any case, layer shifts are annoying and generally ruin the print. So we know what a layer shift is, but how do they happen? Well, I think there's three categories and the first is a physical obstruction or snag on the 3D printer. The crudest example I can give of this is hitting this printer with a mallet mid print. The print head has come across a physical obstruction that has nothing to do with the printed part. This means it's lost its place, resulting in a layer shift and a ruined print. Obviously, there shouldn't be any mallet ninjas around your printer. Well, at least I hope so. So instead, we're checking for physical obstructions when the printer is idle by taking any components that move through their full range of motion. On a Core XY, we can pretty much ignore the Z travel of the bed and focus on the gantry moving through X and Y. On a bed slinger, we not only have to check the movement of the X axis from left to right, but also the movement of the bed the whole way through the Y axis. Seems simple, but there's more to think about. For instance, things attached to the moving parts such as umbilical cables and wiring looms. Again, on a Core XY, this one should be quite straightforward. If it reaches the furthest extent in the corners, you should be good. But on a bed slinger, we need to account for changes in Z height as well. And that's because typically there's a single loom going from the main board all the way up to the edge of the X axis gantry. And that means the higher the z-axis goes, the less slack there is in the cable. So even if it feels the cable is long enough at the bottom and doesn't get snagged, on a bed slinger, you still need to check when the gantry is higher, as there may not be enough slack from a certain height onwards. A similar component to check are any PTFE tubes going to the print head. And if, for demonstration purposes, we make this one shorter, we can see that it starts to constrain the movement when the print head moves far enough away from the origin of the tube. For similar reasons, it can be important to check that there's no tangles in your filament spool. When loading up, it's not that hard to have a simple tangle that gets tighter the further the filament is pulled. On a bed slinger in particular, when the print head moves far enough away from the source of filament, the snag can cause a skipped step and consequently a layer shift. Another specific one are 3D printers with V rollers that ride on 2020 extrusion. When you're taking the printer through its range of motion, you need to make sure that it rolls smoothly. Let's say for instance that the V-roller was adjusted to be too tight. This may lead to a tight or flat spot, which seems fine when there's nothing on it, but add the weight of the printed part. And later on during printing, you might have enough of an obstruction to cause a layer shift, so always aim for smooth motion. And of course, testing all of this on the bench is fine, but to be thorough, you need to test the range of motion where the printer resides especially with the bed slinger, whereas if you have the printer too far forward or back, when the movement of the bed extends beyond the footprint of the printer, it may hit a foreign object. It's also a good idea to make sure cables are free and to give them as much movement space as you're able to. Generally, what we've covered so far is gonna be found when you're either assembling or building the printer. So let's move on to the more mysterious ones. Our second category is again a physical collision, but this time the printer collides with the part that's currently being printed. As we know, our 3D prints are built from the bed up, layer by layer. So to avoid layer shifts, we need to ensure that the nozzle isn't colliding with the old layer when it's printing the next. And most of the time it doesn't, but 9 times out of 10 when it does, it's because of poor part cooling, causing an edge to peel up. There's certain geometry that exacerbates this, and normally it's steep overhangs, especially when this portion is small. 
the plastic will coil up and then catch the nozzle the next time it comes through. When you're printing a small model, more likely than not, the model will be knocked off the bed by this collision. But the layer shift can still happen if you have a part with a large wide base that's firmly gripping the bed. We can see that's what happened here on this Yoda. The ears have a steep overhang, the plastic would have curled up, caught the nozzle, but the model was too big to dislodge, so therefore the steppers lost steps and the layer shift occurred, ruining the print. It would seem that the obvious solution is to simply upgrade your printer's part cooling system. And previously, I tested this Hero Me solution that supports a very wide range of printers. But not everyone is capable or willing to do hardware modification, which is why it's lucky we can still do quite a bit within the slicer. Firstly, in our speed section, most slicers will have an option to slow down for overhangs and even a setting to slow down for curled perimeters. Orca Slicer, which you're seeing here, has quite a lot that you can dial in if you want to do the tuning. Furthermore, if you come up to your filament settings and then go to cooling, you can toggle slow printing down for better layer cooling and false cooling for overhangs and bridges. With all of this on, if we slice the model and then change our preview to show speed, we can see that the slower sections are where the steep overhangs are, the whole way along the ears, and other crucial areas such as underneath the chin and eyebrows. Let's now see these settings in action. On the far left hand side, where we have the overhang, we can see that the outer perimeter is done visibly slower than the rest of the print. And we're about to see another section which explains how this technique works. As the printer tries to extrude this long unsupported bridge in the middle, as well as the completely unsupported cantilever on the right hand side, we can see how slowly it goes. Now obviously the filament is molten when it comes out, and going this slowly means the part cooling fan is blowing on the extruded plastic for long enough that it's able to set, harden and hold its shape even though it's in midair. That makes for impressive bridging like you're seeing here, but also stops small edges from curling up and catching the nozzle. We can see for the infill section on the cantilevered overhang that it's going much faster and as a result the extrusion is a lot messier. On the left here we'll see another example. Tiny contact patch, steep overhangs, but because the perimeter is printed slowly it stops the edges from curling up and amazingly this print stays in place. But for a larger print this same technique will prevent the edges from curling up, the nozzle colliding and causing a layer shift. If these slicer settings still don't give you enough cooling well there's another trick you can do. On cheaper and older printers, the part cooling generally only comes from one side. Overall, it's not very strong, but it's definitely stronger on the side where the fan is blowing from. So you can look at your model, identify the steepest overhang that's most likely to curl, and then simply rotate the model to face the part cooling fan for maximum effect. Other tricks, if you can get away with it, is coming into your filament setting and taking 10 degrees also off your nozzle temperature, which will further reduce the chances of the filament curling up and you can also come to walls and surfaces and tick avoid crossing walls. That's going to alter the travel moves so they're less likely to go over these perimeters with the overhang and further reduce the chances of the nozzle catching. And if all else fails, you can play with your attraction settings, namely by experimenting with the different forms of Z-Hop. I'm going to turn this right up to exaggerate the effect, but Z-Hop will lift the nozzle up before then traveling sideways to make sure it's clear of colliding with the model. But keep in mind that while this does reduce the chances of layer shifts, it does increase the chances of stringing. Another reason to tune retraction, especially if you've fitted a larger nozzle, is that if you get your retraction wrong, there's more likely to be large blobs left behind on the model, and that increases the risk of the nozzle catching them and causing a layer shift. Finally, the spookiest of all, layer shifts without any physical collision. That's right, you can have the stepper motors lose position and cause a layer shift without any contact just from the motion of the printer. To understand this, we need to understand just how stepper motors work. They use a combination of static magnets and electromagnets, and the magnets are turned on and off in sequence to get the interior to rotate. If we have a physical collision, the magnetism isn't strong enough to overcome the physical obstruction. But if we ask the stepper motor to accelerate too fast, particularly if it's driving a lot of mass, it's possible for the torque required to exceed that which the stepper can provide, causing skip steps and layer shifts. And the key is acceleration rather than top speed. This Benchy has the speed set to 200 millimeters per second, but since it's small, there's not enough distance to accelerate to that feed rate. Here's the exact same G-code, but with the acceleration up from 500 to 10,000. When we put the two side by side, it becomes very obvious how much of a harder time the stepper motors will have with higher acceleration as the print head whips back and forth. 
So how much acceleration is too much acceleration for your printer and likely to lead to skip steps and layer shifts. The best thing you can do is run a test to find out for your particular printer. And I have an acceleration tuning tab on the calibration section of my website. As the graphics here suggest, its main aim is to cut down on ringing. But if you input high enough acceleration values, it's possible to induce layer shifts. A similar test that you can run if your printer is on Clipper is the resonance tower tuning test and I've linked the instructions for this in the video description. In either case, the important thing is that you rerun the test using higher and higher values until you experience layer shifts. We can see up the top of this particular test that pretty frequent and severe layer shifts have occurred for both X and Y. So what you can do is look at the height at which these start to reference the inputs to the test and find the acceleration value that was too much for your printer. Just remember that this acceleration limit needs to be interpreted differently depending on the type of printer. For instance, on a Core XY or Delta printer, the moving parts have the same mass throughout the print. Whereas on a bed slinger, the Y axis will get heavier as the print continues. Increasing the chances of a layer shift, the higher and heavier the build gets. So consider setting a more conservative limit in this case. When you have your values, my page has instructions for Marlin, Clipper and RepRap firmware for saving acceleration limits to the firmware. But that's not the only place you need to check because many slices these days under the speed section will have acceleration values that are input into the G-code to change it dynamically through the print. If any of these exceed the safe limit you've tested for, you're gonna have a big chance of a layer shift. If you don't wanna lower them all individually, you can open up the printer profile, come to motion ability and turn off emit limits to G-code. This will make the printer stick to the limits that you've previously set in the firmware. And one more thing to check, the travel acceleration is just as important as all of the other values. You can often get away with a higher feed rate for travel moves because you're not having to extrude plastic, but in terms of acceleration and layer shifts, printing and travel moves need to be treated the same way. An important topic to bring up here is input shaping, first brought on by Clipper, but now in every major firmware in one form or another. In my experience in testing, Input shaping not only reduces ringing on the surface of the part, but also reduces the risk of layer shifting for the same speed and acceleration values. So make sure you have it turned on when you test. Let's finish with something that's very easy to overlook, but can lead to these type of layer shifts. And that's a loose belt pulley on the stepper motor. Let's purposely loosen off these grab screws to show how the problem can manifest. If you don't have a strong junction here, the movement of the stepper motor won't translate into movement of the print head. And depending on how loose the grub screws are, this might be fine when homing and printing slowly, but as soon as acceleration increases, you're going to have a slip and that's gonna lead to a layer shift. So as a matter of maintenance, and especially if you're all of a sudden having layer shifts, check the grub screws on your belt pulleys and make sure they're nice and tight. One more thing that fits into this category and is easy to overlook is stepper motor current as well as cooling. If your stepper motor current is far too low, there just won't be enough torque, the stepper motor will lose steps and a layer shift can occur. However, if the current is too high and the stepper motor driver is starting to overheat, you'll get random erratic movements also leading to layer shifts. So for the lowest chances of layer shifts occurring, make sure that you tune your stepper motor current, fit heat sinks to the drivers and active cooling. This will minimize the risk of layer shifts when things get tougher. Let's very quickly cover printers that have inbuilt layer shift detection. And years ago, I tested these S42B closed loop stepper motors, which is the source of this footage of me hitting the printer with a mallet earlier in this video. Once fitted, these stepper motors keep track of what's been requested by the firmware versus what's actually happened. So if a layer shift does occur, mallet or otherwise, they will detect this and move back into the intended position. The mallet is an extreme example, but the results are pretty impressive. The only printer I've reviewed since then with inbuilt closed loop motion control is the Magneto X from Piopoli, which actually has linear motors instead of stepper motors. It also measures the actual versus planned movement and will correct up to a point, in which case the gap is too big and the printer shuts down. Both of these closed loop systems should be able to correct a layer shift in the case of a small nozzle collision. But if there's anything more permanent and serious, there's only so much they can do. Some printers, like those from Prusa as well as Bamboo Lab, have a rudimentary form of crash detection. If while printing, they detect skip steps and a layer shift, they will raise Z and rehome X and Y to refine their position and hopefully get the subsequent layers realigned with those already printed. 
However, these systems are only as good as the accuracy of the homing, which means you still might have minor layer shifts present in the final print. Hopefully, this video provides a checklist of what to do and what to check if you are suffering from a layer shift. And if you've got any tips that I've missed, please share them down in the comments section for the benefit of others. This video was requested by Yoost, so thank you very much for that. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy layer shift free 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.